so uh, you know very often in the Bible you read about the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom and they fight against each other and many many kings I don't know if anybody can anybody name all the kings you can. Okay. All right. okay. Anyway, there was a king in the south, the southern kingdom. You know, this is after Rehoboam, Jeroboam, the separation of kingdom. So there's a king in the south called Asa. Okay, you know him? Who was the king in the north at that time? Basha. Basha. Asa and Basha. Okay. And um, the the king in the the, the king in the, the south wants to very much capture the whole area of the north, and he decides to make a pact with. A man in Damascus by the name of Ben Haddad and he says you know what if you make a pact with me I will send you all kinds of temple treasures and treasures from my palace and he does that okay to cut a long story short because I'm cutting very short over here I'm very nervous talking to both groups but um, no 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 it's okay it's all right guys it's fine okay uh, so then they um, he, they do they beat them and they take over many of the cities in the north and Ben Haddad of Damascus then puts up in Dan what we call a victory steel and that is a big stone with a whole few lot of words I Ben Haddad of Damascus I uh, captured the city of Dan together with the house of David the house of David the the southern kingdom okay all right so that's a very very significant been captured he puts up the steel now what happens a couple of kings later I'm now talking about King Ahab who's in the north and he has a battle a place called Afek and he situation is now reversed what is he gonna do with that victory steel he's gonna smash it he's gonna take it and he's gonna smash it up into pieces and he's gonna use those pieces of stone we've been talking about secondary building and recycling you've got some good pieces of stone put them in a pavement so when they did the archaeological excavation, they found this pavement with this old piece of stone uh, with, a, with the name uh, House of David. And if you went into the archaeological section of the Israel Museum, it has the pride of place because we're looking for um, mentions of King David and to understand that the house of David and the, you know, David was a very, very significant figure, which there are some archeologists in this country call him a petty chieftain. We won't talk, we won't call them, we won't mention them by name. Okay, so that is the second find is the house of David. And the third find over here, Abraham Gate, house of David, and the, this wall, uh, this platform over here. Now I'm not talking about this, wall I'm talking about the wall behind it when archaeologists came and excavated that area they found this phenomenal platform which has been built literally the way King Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem they find similarities and we have what we have you look at the stones we've got headers and stretchers you know what headers and stretchers are you've got a stone the shape and one time the stone is put this way and one time the stone is put that way and, this, and it's beautifully cut and there is in between the stones um, a layer of cedar wood layer of cedar wood in case there would be an earthquake the building over here is amazing something about this platform and then finding the cultic center next to it we put two and two together and we realize that that platform must have had the gold calf on top. Now isn't that an amazing find? Mm. Amazing find. I mean, the, the platform is unique. We don't find anything else built like that. Okay, the attention to detail and the way it was built is absolutely unique. So that's the platform on which the gold calf stood and this is the area of the cultic center which was used for hundreds of years and I'm drawing your attention to the to the um, the altar over here, the four-horned altar. Who remembers any mention of the Bible when this is used? Yeah, also when he touched the ark when it fell. Right. So I had a whole discussion in my, my last group with the horns of the altar. So I went and did some research. <laughs> okay. Okay. Where are we? Mentioned three times in the Old Testament. Psalm 118, verse 27. Okay. The Lord is God and he's made his light to shine upon us, bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. Time of festivity and praise of the tabernacle, horns of the altar. Ezekiel chapter 43 talks about the horns of the altar that will exist in the future millennial temple. Amos, okay, you see I did a serious research. I don't remember it all, that's why I 
Look at that piece of paper. Okay. Mentions the horns of the altar, saying the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground, used in connection with the altars of Beth El. Remember, Jeroboam put their two golden calves, one in one in the north in Dan and one further south of the northern kingdom in, in Bethel. So this re reference refers to the altars of pagan worship in the divided kingdom. Clearly, that's Amos. Okay. Now, who ran and grabbed hold of the, of the horns? Adonaiah. Remember the period where he tried to take the, uh, wanted to become king, okay, instead of Solomon? So he runs for his life and he grabs hold of, of the horns of the altar. And there are another, a couple of times the horns are mentioned. So I'm referring you to this because guys, you want to know when you get back home and you read these things in the Bible and you hear about the horns of the altar, this is what it looked like. In Beersheba, in the south, we have found literally the structure with the horns. In Shiloh, Shiloh, where the tabernacle was for 369 years, we've also found horns. So this is really, really significant over here. man your leader if you're a pastor your leader if you if you wherever you work your leader and you got to realize that those who follow you are going to follow in your footsteps and you got to realize that it's so important to understand that and Jeroboam had great promise Jeroboam had many opportunities and in your notes you've got an opportunity to see not only the, his identity and not only his responsibility but you're going to see his iniquity and you're going to see his legacy everybody here has a legacy you're gonna leave behind a legacy. The question is, what kind of legacy will you leave behind? Jeroboam, first king of the northern kingdom, right? You got Saul, then you got David, then you have Solomon. Solomon has a son named Rehoboam, okay? He was the king over the southern kingdom, over Judah. And then you have Jeroboam, who became king over the northern kingdom. And there were 10 kingdom, or, or 10, uh, um, uh, tribes that he became king over and God gave him a great promise and I, his identity is wrapped around the fact that what Solomon saw in him Solomon saw something in Jeroboam and it says these words in the book of 1st Kings 1st Kings chapter 11 verse number 28 now the man Jeroboam was a valiant warrior and when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious he appointed him over all the forced labor of the of the house of Joseph. I mean, he re Solomon saw something in Jeroboam and said, "Man, this guy, man, he's a this guy's a warrior. I gotta have this guy leading somewhere in this arena in which I am overseen as a king." So he took Jeroboam and put gave him responsibility. Now remember, Solomon 
Isn't it interesting that Solomon had all these wives, all these concubines, but the Bible says one kid. That's all we know, one kid. How do you have one kid and 300 wives? I don't know, man. I don't get it. But only Rambo's the guy. That's the guy. And you know what? You know, if you got one kid, don't mess it up, right? He had one kid. He messed it up. You, you just can't afford to do that. And Solomon messed it up because he, he, he married foreign wives. We get to Israel, we get to Jerusalem, we're going to see the the, 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 the the mount in which all of his wives built their altars. And it's like, come on, man, you, you, Solomon, you had the promise. Don't marry foreign wives. He married foreign wives. Don't collect for yourself many horses. He collected many horses. He just did what God said not to do. And so Rehoboam's going to follow his footsteps. And on top of that, you got Jeroboam now, and he now, oh, it's starting to rain. Hang tight. I might need my umbrella, Avery. Okay, there it is right there. And so you, now you have Jeroboam, and now he becomes the ruler of the 10 tribes over Israel because after uh, he meets the prophet uh, Ahiyah, and Ahiyah takes his robe, tears it, and says, look, you're gonna be the king over 10 tribes. And he gets this great promise in uh, 1 Kings chapter 12. Listen to what God says to the prophet. Uh, Avery, I need my, oh, you got, you got my umbrella? I need someone to stand on me with an umbrella. I got you. <laughs> All right. No, no, Avery can have it. Give me somebody else. Who's got an umbrella? Yes. See, here's the problem. Here's the problem. When Jesus preached, he didn't have to have a Bible. He didn't have, he knew it all, right? And it was all memorized. So he didn't have to worry about his, his notes getting wet, his Bible getting wet. But I'm not Jesus, that's obvious, okay? So anyway, listen to this. The prophet Ahia said these words in 1 Kings chapter 12. He said these, <clears throat> he says, I will take the whole kingdom out of Rehoboam's hand and I will make him ruler of the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose to observe my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom from his son's hand and give it to you, even ten tribes. But to his son I will give one tribe, that my servant David may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen for myself to put my name. And I will take you, and you shall reign over whatever you desire, and you shall be king over Israel. Then it will be that if you listen to all my commandments, this is all you got to do, right? Listen to all my commandments and walk in my ways. Do what is right in my sight by observing my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, that I will be with you and build you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. Now listen, that's all he had to do. Hey, we're good. That's all he had to do. All he had to do. Listen, you ever read all these books on leadership? There's so many books on leadership. Throw them all away. Just throw them all away. Why, all you got to do is observe the commandments of God and walk in His ways. That's it. Amen. You want to be a great leader, just do what God says. It's not that difficult. It's not rocket science. But we have all these books on leadership saying, well, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do... You know what? Just observe what God says. Obey His word. Keep His commandments. Walk in His ways. God says, man, you have an enduring kingdom. And Jeroboam's like, wow, man, this is so cool. That's all they got to do. Guess what? He doesn't do it. He doesn't do it. Because the model he had was Solomon. Solomon didn't do it. You would think that we get that. Now he says to this, all you gotta do is do as your father David did. Because David becomes the hall, listen carefully. David becomes the hallmark for all the kings. If you do, ah, see the sun's shining on the righteous, baby. Look at that. Sun, even on the unrighteous. Some of you unrighteous, sun's shining on the unrighteous too. So anyway, it's still raining though, isn't it? But anyway, so uh, the standard for the kings was to, to do as their father David did. That's all they had to do. You say, well, wait a minute. Didn't David commit adultery? Yes. Didn't David murder Uriah the Hittite? Yes. Okay. But David was a repentant man. He was a man after God's own heart. He understood confession of sin. He understood contrition. He understood repentance. He understood how to how to follow God. Yes, he sinned, but man, I tell you, he could repent like nobody's business. And that's why he was a man after God's own heart. And we'll see when we get to in getting, right? You're gonna understand the character of 
David because he never sought revenge and he always had a repentant heart and that's what it means to be a man after God's own heart. Those two elements made David the man that he was. And so here is Jeroboam and uh, he the prophet says, this is all you got to do, man. Walk in the ways of your father David. Observe the commandments of your Lord. That's it. Walk in God's ways. No big deal. So Solomon hears that. What's Solomon say? I got to kill Jeroboam. I got to kill Jeroboam because he, he's got 10 tribes. I had them all. My king gets two. He gets 10. He's got to die. Jeroboam flees to Egypt. Bad thing. Bad thing because there he learned more and more about idolatry. So he comes back to be the king. Okay, because the people compel him to come back. Solomon dies. He comes back to be the king because Rehoboam is just putting the burden upon the people. And they beg Jeroboam to come back. So Jeroboam comes back from Egypt. He becomes king of the ten tribes. Okay, I'm going to go really quickly here, so listen carefully. So he comes back to be king over these ten tribes. But here's what he does. Okay, this is always a problem. He sets out to make religion convenient and comfortable without cost. Any religion, any church that's convenient and comfortable is a bad church. He makes religion convenient, comfortable, and without, without cost. Therefore, it's not Christ-like. You can't worship without cost. You can't worship in the comfort and convenience of your home. And what Jeroboam does, he sets up an altar right here in Dan. And you're going to see that altar. It's right here. He sets up one in Bethel, the house of God, the most southern part of his domain. He puts golden calves there. And what he does is he wants to make worship easy because he is, a, he is concerned. Fear grips the man. And fear grips him because he's afraid because Israel had to go to Jerusalem three times a year to observe the feast, he said, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up worship my way. I'm gonna worship God my way. Because if I can do it my way, it becomes convenient for everybody. Everybody now is comfortable. I win the people's prize and, and I become the great king that I need to be and they're gonna come and love me. So that's what he does. And people are like, whoa, wow, this is great, man. We don't gotta go all the way to Jerusalem. I can stay right here in Dan and worship, worship God. And all that did was turn people further and further away. He set up a golden calf here, set up a golden calf there, something that God said not to do. You would think he would learn from his fathers from Mount Sinai what took place there. Didn't learn, right? And so what he did was set up those two altars and people could come to worship him. As soon as he did that, another prophet comes. I hear that guy's name. How much time have I been preaching here, Patrick? Keep time on me. I'm trying to get it quick. Nine minutes? Oh, wow. Okay. So here he comes. <clears throat> Another prophet comes. A man of God comes and tells him, hey, look, in modern day vernacular, dude, you're doing it all wrong. You're in big trouble. So much trouble, this is what's going to happen to you. And he prophesies 300 years into, a, into the future and even gives the name of the king that's going to come and destroy the altars in Israel. His name is Josiah. He gives a prophecy right here in 1 Kings chapter 13. He says, and, and the prophet, the man of God came. Now behold, there, there, there came a man of God from Judah to, to Bethel by the word of the Lord while Jeroboam was standing by the altar to burn incense. This is what Jeroboam did. He appointed his own priest, not for the tribe of Levi, just anyone he wanted. He couldn't do that. And he himself even tried to offer burn, burn incense on the altar. So he himself tried to become a priest and he appointed others to be priests and they weren't qualified to be there. He just did worship his way. He did worship any way he wanted to do it and everybody was fine with that. Except the man of God who came to prophesy and the Lord God of Israel. And the man of God came to prophesy in Bethel where, where uh, Jeroboam was and he cried against the altar. He didn't even look at Jeroboam. Let's pretend that you're Jeroboam and you're sitting there at the altar. He's not even going to look at Jeroboam. He's going to look right at the altar. He's going to ignore Jeroboam because Jeroboam makes no difference. He don't care about him. He cares about God. And he's concerned about the altar that he built 
that was blasphemy against God. So he prophesies against the altar. Doesn't even look at Jeroboam. Doesn't have to. And Jeroboam's in earshot. Oh man, this is so good, man. I just love the Old Testament. It is so rich. It is so practical. And so look what happens. He says, and he cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, the son shall be born to the house of David. House of David. That's now Judah, where Rehoboam is. Okay? And it says, Josiah by name, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests on high places who burn incense to you, and human bones shall be burned to you. And then he gave a sign the same, saying, This is a sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be split apart, and the ashes which are on it shall be poured out. Wow. He says, look, it's going to come. This is Josiah 300 years later. That's how accurate the prophecy was. And Jeroboam doesn't like it. So he sticks out of the hand and says, seize him. And as he sticks out his hand, his hand becomes numb and withers. It's in the text. You got to read it. Give it take some time. And his hand withers. And he cries out to the prophet. Oh, can you heal me? Can you heal me? He doesn't care about repenting. He doesn't care. There's a sign here. Look, dude, you got to repent. You got to turn from your sin. Oh, heal me, heal me. So, so the Lord heals him. And to the prophet, God heals the guy. Jeroboam's healed. And Jeroboam said, I want you to come to my house for dinner. And God told him, the, pro, the old man, the prophet said, you can't do that. Don't go eat with him. Don't dine with him. Don't do oh, that. Yeah. You're not his friend. Oh, yeah. Don't go there. And so he did. Long story short, the prophet ends up dying anyway. But the problem of the whole thing is this, that Jeroboam did not listen to the prophecy. He did not listen to the word of the Lord when he was warned. He did not listen to the beautiful promise that was given to him by Ahia. So his son gets sick. His son gets sick, so what's he gonna do? He's gotta do something. He's all into the, the physicality of his life. So he says, he tells his wife, to dress in a different way, to go to the prophet Ahia, who is now blind, can't see, and she goes, go to him and ask him what to do about my son, see if my son can be healed. So she goes to Ahia, and the, the Lord tells Ahia that he's coming, even though he's blind, and when the knock comes, he says, come in, the wife of Jeroboam, and he's blind. And again, prophesies, and this is what he says, he says, come in, wife of Jeroboam, and why do you pretend to be another woman? For I am sent with you with a harsh message. Go say to Jeroboam, can you imagine you're the wife, you got a kid, you're gonna go look for help, and, he, and the prophet says, I got a harsh message for you. You're not gonna like what I gotta say. In fact, you're gonna hate what I gotta say. That's just the way it is. And it says this, because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. Yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do only which was right in my sight. You also have done more evil than all who were before you and have gone and made for yourself other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I am bringing calamity on the house of Jeroboam. And he goes on and says, I'm going to cut off your line. I'm going to destroy your family. You did calamity and you blasphemed the name of God. This is a very sad place unless you learn the lesson. If you learn the lesson, it becomes a very joyous place because you know not to make the mistake that Jeroboam made. Jeroboam was the first of 19 kings of the northern kingdom. They were all bad. All 19 were bad. Nothing good about any of them. They were all bad because they followed after. You know why? The Bible tells us. <clears throat> and he will give up Israel on the account of the sins of Jeroboam, which he committed and with which he made Israel to sin. That was Jeroboam's legacy. He made Israel to sin over 20 different times in the book of first kings and second kings it says and they made israel to sin as jeroboam made israel to sin they followed the line of jeroboam that was his legacy what is your legacy what are you leaving behind are people that have fallen to sin 
and fall further away from God because of you or because of your testimony and because of your leadership and because of your commitment to Christ, they follow in the footsteps of a godly example. We're here today, learn this lesson. We need to be godly people, to walk in the ways of God, to follow the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so others will have a clear testimony on how to live their lives. Because if you do that, God brings you honor because you have honored Him. Let me tell you something. I am here today, I am here today because I had a godly mother and a godly father who went to Faith Community Church, and we got 10 people from there that went to Faith Community Church, and they, 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 they brought me there, and I was saved when I was 14, and God used that church and used the leaders of that church to train my parents so they could train me. And the legacy was left. Follow God and honor His name. And that's the lesson for today. We pray with you. God, thank you for today. Give us a great day. Hold off the rain. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Yeah, I'm done. Good. All right. Woo.